Well, here we are, Tuesday night. <laughs> um, my plan was to go ahead and just start reading from the book, and I just don't feel that's what we're supposed to do either. We've got the, the book. It's called God's Appointed Customs. You have that picture? <laughs> there are some customs and traditions. You can go back out to. There are some customs and traditions that come from that are Jewish in nature. People call it Jewish customs. But they are actually originated in the Bible. An example would be circumcision. It is a commanded act in the Bible for our people to follow. So circumcision is a right that's only found in modern times in uh, uh, Judaism. They do have other cultures that circumcise their children, but they got these strange, weird things that they do with them, such as uh, radical circumcision for girls. Hello. So those uh, those are not the kinds of things that we approve of. If it's not directly stated in the Bible, then we don't observe it. So does that bring up any other things that you would like to ask about? How do I get a hat like that I saw the Zephina wear one? It's like a braided keeper, I mean a beaded keeper. Is that right? Yeah. You'll have to ask her that one. I didn't buy it. But there a lot of the uh, uh, Judaica shops around have that kind of uh, keep up for women, for women, specifically designed for women. Next question would be, why do we wear kippahs? Do you know? God said so. The head covering. Only for the high priest. But aren't we? Aren't we the priesthood? We are. So therefore, should we not wear of that? Uh, or <laughs> well, heart? did God call us uh, to be a nation of? priests yes and even traditional conventional uh, Judaism teaches that God will be among us live among us mm -hmm. shalom shalom and to you and to you as well sir so does the priest then have an instruction that he must keep his head covered at all times? Doesn't say all times. For the most part, yeah. He said he's not to uncover his head for the death of a family member or a um,
There's really not any reason for him to uncover his head. And why is the high priest then required to keep his head covered? Because God said so. <laughs> What does the high priest do? He mediates sacrifices for sins between us mm -hmm. in heaven. Uh, CRRA? Mm -hmm. I can't read that word. Mm -hmm. Well, he acts as an intermediary mm -hmm. between us. And separates him from others. I don't understand what he means. Well, it doesn't really tell us the why, it just tells us to. Which is why I said because God tells us to. <laughs> the high priest had a responsibility. Yeah. He was the intermediary between God and man. He could hear from God, he spoke for God, and so consequently. He was not to allow himself to become defiled for any reason. Not even for his mother or father. How does a man become defiled? By the things of this world? Any way he wants to. Any way he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> Uh, it goes back to the one way, which is going contrary to what God outlined. Breaking the fellowship on either side. He said over here, breaking the fellowship on the other side. Mm -hmm. Either side. Either side. Yeah. So, what are God's instruction about the priest? Does he require the priest to remain un undefiled? Um... Yes. From your reading of the Bible, is that the way it reads to you? It does. While still okay. giving us um, a picture of, yeah, we're probably still going to screw it up along the way. <laughs> and here's what to do in those situations. Okay, so... But we should be striving nonetheless. If he cuts his finger as he's... Is he defiled? Depends according on to the Bible. The, according to the Bible, it depends on what you would call how extent extent of a cut. He is unclean. Yeah. No matter he the extent of the if cut. He cuts his finger until it heals. Mm -hmm. What about um, what if he touches a dead body? Yes. Or touches somebody who is unclean for some reason. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Until sunset. Having an expulsion of uh, uh, the seminal fluids from the body will make him unclean. So what if he is sleeping and he has what's called a wet dream? Does he become unclean? Yes. 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 So the Bible gives very specific instructions on what to do if that happens to you. Um, he used to bathe himself in water, and then at sundown he will become clean. He used to wash his clothes as well. His clothes and his, and his body. Mm -hmm. um, so these have all become traditions in Jewish culture um, that we... Uh, the derivative teaching where this comes from is the scripture that says that uh, in that day God will tabernacle among us. He will tabernacle um, among us in, in our midst. And since we have no priest today, then the individual becomes a priest for God. And he is responsible for trying to keep the instructions that God gives the priest to. Um, so 
the rabbis teach that uh, the men should wear a kippah because it is a covering for you between you and God uh, should you have a need to pray at any moment during the day and then you forget not to cover your head you can't come before the Lord without your head covered and so that's what, how they deduced uh, having uh, a head covering a kippa. So in orthodoxy um, the men wear something called payas. Payas is the side locks. Mm -hmm. Okay? You've probably seen those in movies or whatever. Yeah. Um, the payas is an instruction about charitable giving. How do we derive that? I thought it had to do with not cutting the sides, the instruction on facial hair. Well, it's on the head or the beard. It's a reminder of the time when the, when we had to offer the tithe of the four corners of the, well, a tenth of the, of the field of the harvest, and whatever I that was not collected, that just falls naturally to the ground, is a... Uh, Essentially, a uh, what do you call it? A um, um, is uh, f an offering for those that uh, you know who are in need will come to the field and grow. It and becomes a part of the gleanings. The gleanings, yeah. For the poor. For the poor, yeah. So that they will have food to eat. And God's very uh, vocal about taking care of the poor. So, the payas then means corners. The literal definition of it means corners. Corners of the hair, corners of the field, uh, even the corners on our uh, prayer garments has the seat seat on it, which is a part of the uh, ritual of Jewish prayer. Um, so these are all reminders that we are supposed to count ourselves as blessed and to be kind and generous to those who are less fortunate there are lots of things in the Bible particularly in the New Testament that become troublesome for Christians because they don't know about the law of, of uh, generosity to the poor. And I'm trying to think where an example of that is. Okay. I'm trying to. There's a couple of really excellent examples, and now I can't pull them up in my head. <laughs> it's one of these days, you know. Um, let me see if I can pop it up in a concordance. I think my brain is wanting a vacation tonight. That's what I think was happening here. Um, let's see. Larry. Yes, sir. Do you remember a uh, scripture that uh, we talked about one time that was about 
it was confusing and then we talked about it and then you realized that it was actually talking about charitable giving. Do you remember that? Vaguely. You don't remember where that was or what the story was, do you? I wish I did. Corinthians? No, I would it was in a parable of Yeshua. I just can't remember where. And yes, if you ask me, it's more card corner. Well, so much for that. <laughs> well. I have to remember a, a part of the phrase that was used or, or something to be able to search it out with a concord. Well, if it's part of the parables of Yeshua, it wouldn't have been around... The one, where, where, are you going? Are you trying to reference the one about the person in the hole? And you have the first person come by, and it no, doesn't. No, that's a different story. Okay, I didn't know that's where you were going. Or the story about the man who passed the poor, and then it, there's a reference out of context about hellfire, where he's in hell now, and the person that was poor on the street that he passed is now in heaven. Right. Lazarus. I remember one that says something like uh, that the poor will always have somebody to take care of them. Mm -hmm. The poor will always be with you. Yeah, the, the poor, poor will always, always be, be with, with you. you. That's not it either. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, what about the parable that Yeshua gave about the person who gave uh, the, those individuals a part of his wealth to manage? Sorry, what is the question? The meek will inherit his kingdom. I don't think that's it either. No. The, the meek will inherit his kingdom. <coughs> um. But the ones about the the field workers who came in like late and they're still yes wages. the field workers yeah. yes the, the wages last were will be still the first same. the first mm -hmm. will be last mm -hmm. right. Sorry, we're grasping for straws here along with you. <laughs> yeah, well. The spirit's not guiding me in this either. The reaching the mark is it? <laughs> uh, um. I guess it's not where we're supposed to be right now. <coughs> okay, Lord, what do you want me to do here? You're not helping <laughs> me out any tonight. <laughs> well, on I that. know what we forgot to do. We to pray. Yeah! <laughs> okay. I just thought I missed it. Well. Shabbat Shemayim, our Father who is in the heavens, we ask you, Lord, to be with us tonight, to teach us and to bring us into your ways, help us to understand your paths. Lord, I ask you to be with us as we study that we will be able to, to learn because you are the master teacher. And we ask you to teach tonight. Everybody say it. Lord, I'm hungry. Lord, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I ask you to feed me. I ask you to feed me. And I'm thirsty, Lord. I'm thirsty, Lord. I ask you to give me uh, living water. I ask you to give me living water. So I'll have plenty to give to others. So I have plenty to give to others. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. See if that helps. <laughs> um, okay. So the... Let's just go back and talk about the first instance we find in the Bible of charitable giving. And that's where, um, I believe the first place I remember seeing it was in Ruth, the book of Ruth. Remember that? I was going to say Genesis when Abraham uh, donated a portion after uh, getting back his uh, wife and, or his stolen goods. Different and donated. Topic. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's just go. Um, Okay, we have the story of Ruth and Naomi. And Naomi's two sons married two Moabite women. And, of course, uh, 
something happened and they died, the, the two boys died. And so uh, Naomi told um, the two girls, well, we don't have any more children and they're not likely they're going to be any more children. So I release you from your vows. And she sent them back to Moab, but Ruth wouldn't go. She, she said, but I want, your, I want your God to be my God and your people will be my people and all that. Okay, so she went back with Naomi home and um, in uh, verse 18 in chapter 1 it says when Naomi saw that she was de determined to go with her she said no more to her so she tried to talk uh, Ruth into staying with her people And they journeyed to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a prominent wealthy member of Elimelech's uh, clan whose name was Boaz. Uh, but the woman from Moab said to Naomi, Let me go into the field and glean ears of grain behind anyone who will allow me to. In other words, she's aware of the rule of of uh, letting the poor glean, glean the uh, harvest so they can have food to eat. And she said, Go, my daughter. And she, sent, she set out and arrived at a field and gleaned behind the reapers. She happened to be in a part, <laughs> I can hardly read this without crying. It really hits me. She happened to be in a part of the field that belonged to Boaz from Elimelech's clan. When Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to the reapers, Yahweh be with you, and they responded, Yahweh bless you. And then Boaz asked the servant supervising the reapers, Whose girl is this? The servant supervising the reapers said, She's a girl from Moab who returned with Naomi from the plain of Moab. Uh, she said, please let me glean and gather what falls from the sheaves behind the reapers. So she went and has kept at it from morning until now, except for a little rest in the shelter. Boaz said to Ruth, did you hear that, my daughter? <laughs> don't, go, don't go glean in the other fields <laughs> and don't leave this place. But stick here with me, with my working girls. Keep your eyes on whichever field the reapers are working in and follow the girls. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. Whenever you get thirsty, go and drink from the water jars the young men half healed. She fell on her face, prostrating herself, and said to him, Why are you showing me so much favor? You're beautiful! <laughs> <laughs> Why are you paying attention to me? After all, I'm only a foreigner. And Boaz answered her, I've heard the whole uh, story, everything you've done. For your mother-in-law since your husband died, including how you left your father and mother in the land that you were born in to come to a people about whom you knew nothing beforehand. May Yahweh reward you for what you have done. May you be rewarded in full by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. She said, My Lord, I hope I continue pleasing you. You have comforted and encouraged me, even though I'm not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come and have something to eat. and Dip your piece of bread in the olive oil and the vinegar. And she sat by the reapers. They passed her some roasted grain, and she ate until she was full. And she had some left over. When she got up, Boaz ordered his young men, let her glean even among the sheaves themselves without, <laughs> without making her feel ashamed. I mean, she's getting the harvest among the already harvested grains that are already bundled up, okay? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
In fact, pull some ears of grain out from the sheaves <laughs> on purpose and leave them for her to glean and don't rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and when she went out, she had gathered. Uh, when she beat out what she had gathered, it came about a bushel of barley. She picked it up and went back to the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and Ruth brought her, brought out and gave her what she had left over after eating her field. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where were you working? Blessed be the one who took such good care of you. <laughs> she told her mother-in-law with whom she had been working, and she said, The name of the man with whom you were, where I was working is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by Yahweh, who has never stopped showing grace, neither to the living or the dead. Naomi also told her the man is a closely related to us. He is one of our redeeming kinsmen. That's an interesting phrase I've ever did see once. Yep. And as you know, <laughs> Ruth became an ancestor to Messiah. <laughs> but the woman from Moab said, Moreover, he even said to me, Stay close to my young men until they finish my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It's good, my daughter, for you to keep going out with his girls so that you won't encounter hostility in some other field. So she stayed close to Boaz's girls to glean until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, yeah. <laughs> I'll go back up just a little. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I should be seeking security for you so that things will go well with you. Now there's Boaz, our relative. You are with his girls. He's going to be winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So bathe and anoint yourself and put on your good clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but don't reveal your presence to the man until he finishes eating and drinking. When he lies down, take note of where he's lying. Later, go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. I bet he does, too. <laughs> she responded, I will do everything you tell me. She went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had instructed her. After Boaz was through eating and drinking, he was feeling good. He went to lie down at the end of the pile of grain, and she stole in, and uncovered his feet, and laid down. In the middle of the night, the man was uh, startled and turned over, and there was a woman lying at his feet. <laughs> He asked, Who are you? And she answered, I'm your handmaid, Ruth. Spread out your, your robe over your handmaid because you are a redeeming kinsman. This is called the Leverite Law. <laughs> oh, really? Hmm? Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what happens is that when a woman's husband dies in Israel, the redeeming kinsman has to take her as okay. as ahead. his brother's wife. He she becomes his wife. That's the redeeming kinsman. Um, verse ten. He says, "May Yahweh bless you, my daughter. Your latest kindness is even greater than your first." in that you didn't go after the young men, neither the rich ones or the poor. And you didn't go after the... Um, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid, for I will do everything for you, you say. For all the city leaders among my people know that you are a woman of good character. Now, it is true that I am a redeeming kinsman, but there is a redeemer who is a closer relative than I. So he, he has got to be given first pick. Okay. Stay tonight 
If in the morning he will redeem you, fine. Let him redeem you. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, then as Yahweh lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. She lay at his feet until morning. Then before it was light enough that people could recognize each other, she got up because he said no one should know that the woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring the shawl you are wearing take hold, and take hold of it. And she held it while she put six, me he put six measures of barley into, <laughs> into it. And then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she asked, who are you? My daughter? <laughs> she told her everything the man had done for her. <laughs> then she added, He gave me this six measures of barley because he said unto me, You shouldn't return to your mother-in-law with nothing. Naomi said, My daughter, just stay where you are until you learn how the matter comes out. For the man won't rest until he resolves the matter. <laughs> Meanwhile, Boaz had gone up to the gate and had sat down there with the Redeemer. Why would he do that? No. He's going to the court. The court. Why do you think they call courts courts? Courtyard. Because they were originally held in the courtyards for fenced-in cities. And the elders of the city would come there and sit in to listen to matters that are brought up among the people. And then they would hear the rulings and they would be the witnesses to testify how the case turned out. And so he's... When you say witnesses, are you talking... So we take that to the city so that the rest of the population knew what happened? Essentially, they bore witness to the proceedings and, and were witnesses to the verdicts that were issued by the lower court judges. But they carried and, their witness to the, uh, to the people. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so the, there was usually a scribe there to also scribe down what happened. But they have the witnesses too. That's why we have 12 witnesses for our courts. And we get that from Israel's early court system. And um, so the witnesses are actual witnesses who, who can testify about the way the court proceedings went and to record the verdicts and to... Uh, make sure that it gets properly recorded in the uh, court records. Mm -hmm. So the the witnesses are the are the jury, if you will, and they are like the judges that met in early, early days. When they went to court in early days, they went to a city that had the wall built around. And they would go in and sit on uh, seats that were built into the walls. And they would sit there uh, throughout the day to hear matters. And so that was the way the court processing was done every, everywhere in Israel during the early days. Rabbi, so, yes? didn't they usually have the court yard in front of or near the front of the the uh, the wall the city wall gates it was on the way into the to the city through the walls it's the main gate going into yeah. the city through the wall mm -hmm. and so they would come into that court area it was called a courtyard or a court area and they would meet there for the purpose of hearing issues that were being brought up in a community and Boaz wanted to uh, seek the court's judgment because he knew of this, this uh, redeeming kinsman that was a much nearer kinsman than he was. So he had, to, he had the rights to redeem her. 
and the lands and everything else would become his. And so he, he knew the law, and he had to go there and, and uh, process it through the court so that uh, there was a very um, real process that, that was gone through, just like in a court of law. And in this day, the redeeming kinsman, when he would take possession of the woman who would become his bride on behalf of his brother, uh, he would accept her and her properties that came along with the marriage. And if he chooses not to marry her for any reason, then he takes his shoe off of his foot and he passes it to the next redeeming kinsman. And if he decides not to take it, then it's passed on to the next redeeming kin kinsman until there no, are no more redeeming kinsmen remaining. And uh, I don't know what happened then, but it wasn't a pretty picture. <laughs> yeah, my eyes just watering like crazy. I think it's probably uh, molds in this house. I'm not sure. Because my eyes do this quite often. Thing. So we have this... Um, standard procedures that are done when a near kinsman wants to redeem the uh, woman who's a widow. So he said to the, let's see, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there with the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken when he had passed by. See, everybody who lived in this city would pass by into this gate. They've gone out into the fields to work. When they come back into the city, they have to pass through this open court. And so that's where the, how they knew they could have the elders needed to sit and, and hear the judgment of the matter. And so they always had enough elders there to, uh, to bear witness of what the outcome of this this meeting was about. So he came there and sat in the gate and he waited for this for this other uh, near kinsman to come along. And he came over and sat down and took ten of the city's leaders and said, sit down here. And they sat down. So in this case they used ten leaders as witnesses. Um, Uh, he said to the re redeeming kinsman, the parcel of land which used to belong to our relative Elimelech is being offered for sale by Naomi, who has returned from the plain of Moab. I thought I should tell you about it and say, buy it in the presence of the people sitting here and in the presence of the leaders of my people. So they're holding a court with a jury with witnesses and all that. And he's asking him to buy that piece of land. Now, he's not telling him the whole story yet. <laughs> and he's doing this on purpose. <laughs> so, <laughs> the parcel of land which will belong to our relative Elimelech is being offered by, by Naomi for sale, who has returned from the plain of Moab. I thought I should tell you about it and say, buy it in the presence of the people sitting here and in the presence of the leaders of my people. If you want to redeem it, redeem it. But if it is not to be redeemed, then tell me so I can know because there is no one else in line to redeem it and I am after you. And he said, I want to redeem it. Then Boaz said, the same day you buy the field from Naomi, you must also buy Ruth, the um, Levirite law, you know. Uh, let me see here. Uh, by Ruth, the woman from Moab, the wife to, of the deceased son. Now he's letting him know what his real reason is here. <laughs> and uh, in order to raise up in the name of the deceased an heir for his prosperity, the Redeemer said, I can't redeem it for myself. I might put my own inheritance at risk. So his own inheritance would become confused in the issue 
if he took her as the Redeemer's wife. That's just the way the laws are. I mean, why would it confuse that? It just seems like he would add it on. <coughs> maybe, but maybe not. There may be other mitigating things that we don't know about. I know, I wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> So the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. <laughs> and he took off his shoe, and Boaz addressed the leaders of all the people. You are witnesses today that I am purchasing from Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to um, Kilon, Kion, and Machion. And I'm also acquiring as my wife, Ruth, the woman from Moab, the wife of Machion, in order to raise up in the name of the deceased and her an heir for his property, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his kinsmen and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses today, and all the people at the gate and the leaders said, we are witnesses. We will be a remembrance for you in case anybody ever questions this, okay? So all the people at the gate and the leader said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who has come into your house like Rachel and like Leah, who between them built up the house of Israel. Do worthy deeds in Ephrath, become renowned in Bethlehem. May your house, because of the seed of Adonai, will give you from this young woman become like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar bore to Yehuda. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and she had sexual relations. He had sexual relations with her, and Adonai enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to a son, and the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, who today has provided you a Redeemer. That was quick. <laughs> the Redeemer is in the line of the true Redeemer of Israel, Yeshua. <laughs> May his name be renowned in Israel. May he restore your life and provide for your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons. <laughs> and has given birth to him. Naomi took the child and laid it on her breast and became its nurse. The women who were neighbors gave it a name and they said a son has been born to Naomi and called it Ovid. He was the father of Yashi, the father of David. <laughs> Hot doggies! <laughs> Isn't this cool? And I took uh, took the other fellow out of the line and moved her over to the person who wanted her to. Uh, well, let's put it this way: God's thumbprints all over this thing. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. This this is obviously no accident. This is a huh? We need this piece over here and this one here. Right. <laughs> So anyway, to me, I think this really speaks toward our issue of charitable deeds. So, why do we wear the tzitzit? It reminds us that we're charitable people when we're praying to Yahweh. And we're counting on Him to be charitable with us in our needs. So that's why we wear the tzitzit. And why do we um, why do we wear the kippah? Because we are becoming the priesthood of Yahweh, and we're praying that He will dwell amongst us. Awesome, huh? In Judaism, everything has a purpose. And care has been taken to make sure that the 
even the things that would be considered minor laws would be upheld in high, reg high regard by other people. <clears throat> Any comments or questions? Anybody have another question you'd like to cover? What are some minor laws? What are some examples that are related? Well, don't uh, mix the wool with the linen in your clothing. Mm -hmm. The reason why is if you weave the, win the wool and the linen together into a garment, it makes the garment, it cheapens the garment, okay? And uh, in addition to that, huh? I said the fabric would be distorted when it was washed, too. Yeah, there are a lot of things that would cause it to be uh, weakened or whatever. And so he doesn't want us to take a wool garment that's been blended with flax or with linen. Uh, and sell it like it's a fully wool and garment because you really can't tell at first first glance that it's uh, not a wool solid wool garment so linen was was considered more lowly than inferior wool? huh because linen's you know, it's, it's made out of fiber. cotton cloth or that kind of material uh -huh. well cotton I could see it and flax is a part of a uh, a plant product as well. It's very strong stuff. Not only that, the wool will cut into the fibers of the uh, flax or the linen and weaken them or destroy them. So it's not a good thing to mix the wool and the linen together. All I know is that in the uh, tropics, you don't wear wool, you wear linen. <laughs> you gonna do that or silk? <laughs> right. Yeah. A lot harder to come by. So these are even the minor laws or principal principal uh, teachings as far as how to implement other everyday activities or business activities. So that we don't cheat other people. Come on, somebody got a topic for discussion? Oh, I guess you couldn't hear me. What did you say? <laughs> I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, I was just saying that uh, these minor laws are basically a principle that, that guide us to uh, not cheat other people when we... Uh, you know, transact business with other others and right. and uh, and or even just you know, in the c in it doesn't even have to be business. It could just be just everyday activities with other people in the community. Right. But well, we are supposed to be charitable people, and so if you're cheating people with uh, selling a wool garment that's not really wool, then you are you are cheating them. Yeah. And uh, God doesn't want us doing that. Mm -hmm. That's a bad example. How are we going to be examples of a heavenly father? And we're cheating people in that form. Exactly. Right. Right. Example. Right. And so it's been uh, a balance of even remembering to give back a person a pen that you accidentally borrowed so you don't end up realizing later you stole their pen. Mm -hmm. Let alone something a, a bit more uh value like a financial uh deal in real estate and i see that a lot where people will call themselves christian or spiritual or or try to use essentially god in context to put themselves as a trustworthy person and then you look at how they treat in transactions and conduct themselves in their real estate business and I would say, um, you might want to reread Torah first <laughs> five books of the Bible. Yeah, it's a good book. It's really good. <laughs> you might want to read the context. <laughs> Lord reveal what they're doing. But the entire concept of uh, of the um, trust in 
Christ as the kinsman redeemer, whether it was the um, uh, you know if if the uh, if the thief takes your shirt, give him a coat too. The, the the whole idea is you are being blessed and taken care of. You have a kinsman redeemer, and if you don't trust that, then you will be dishonest. But there's no reason to cheat your fellow man. Otherwise, you're worshiping the devil. Yeah. So it comes yeah. down to who you're worshiping. Are you worshiping the true Heavenly Father, Yahweh? Mm -hmm. Or are you worshiping the devil, which is the out confusion and the immorality of the world, fear, and, and you know, all those other things? So, why is it God <laughs> gets so offended if we um, take on another God? Well, in Israel's day, they took on Easter, Easter. Easter is the Aster, yeah. is the modern pronunciation of the pagan deity. Yeah. Why did God hate it so bad for us to do that? Because she is promising to give us the same things that God promised to give us, and it shows that we don't trust Him to do it. Right. Concept of of God is is hardwired into us, and people will look for the right God. And unfortunately, we tend to gather to gods that we imagine will allow us to be what we want, rather than going to the one God and raising, go. <laughs> raising our our. Our goes back to the sayings of the Apostle Russell, Paul. Why do I do the things I don't want to do and do not do the things I want to do and know I should be doing? <laughs> Banging well, head against I'm the wall. The way to death here. <laughs> Banging, I can just imagine him banging his head against the table or the wall at that point. <laughs> All right. Oy and so it goes back to this uh, so does God still hate people who turn to the Easter goddess? Hate the people or hate the, uh, hate the act? Does he hate it when people who have believed in the one true God mm -hmm. turn and observe pagan holidays? Easter is a well, pagan it's holiday. A Halloween or anything else. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a it's one thing when they do it in ignorance. It's another thing when they continue to do it in disobedience. And there's the key. It's one thing. It's one thing when you're in the matrix. It's another thing when you took that pill and you're outside the matrix and you're still trying to get back in. <laughs> I mean, can we really say that we're worshiping the true God if we're still, if uh, if we are worshiping, you know, that pagan deity and still say that, oh, you know, well. You know, this we're still worshiping the Redeemer, Yeshua. Hmm. Bless you. So it goes back to what I said earlier. Because God said so. <laughs> if God took Israel by force into slavery over worshiping the pagan deities of the nations around Israel. And mm -hmm. he did then how, how does he feel about those same issues today? He changes, then he changes not. Right, he changes not. So we might want to prepare ourselves for another cycle. Yeah. Have you noticed the wild gyrations the world is going through right now? Well, Google's already saying... Did you see that article on Google, dog, 29 times in the Google Translate? And it says that the end times are here. <laughs> well, you know, Greece right now is having one of the major fires of their existence in recorded history. And people are walking and running to the ocean to jump in How's to that? keep from getting burned up. That's pretty bad. 
And it's never been done before in modern history. <clears throat> well, and then there's the volcanoes. Not just Hawaii. There's volcanoes I've never heard of in New Mexico, mm -hmm. California, mm -hmm. Washington, and uh, that's not including Mount Helen and Yosemite. Mm -hmm. They're telling people to stay away from Yellowstone right now. Yes, yeah. They believe that that whole volcanic system is going to erupt. That super volcano that's been, been tilting that area? The one they've been talking about for the past 20 years? That's, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Is that in Colorado? That's in California. Oh, California. Yeah. California or Wyoming? It's tech. Colorado's flooded like crazy right now. I yeah. mean, they've got that was recent. flash mm -hmm. floods going on everywhere in, in Colorado. Over in the East Coast, we've got flash floods happening all up and down the East Coast. It's just all over the place. You think God's trying to tell us something? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then in other countries, we're seeing some inter we're seeing movement as well. My mom subscribes to this amazing resource, and uh, it's been making me aware of all of these different uh, chain reactions happening on the fault line I'd never even heard of. That's affecting the majority of Asia, or from Thailand through China. Mm -hmm. and they're they're having some major earthquake and cataclysmic, some pretty pretty big. Uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, death fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And that includes you are traffic. With me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. Yes. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Yes, sir. And no my cup been formed runs against over. Us will prosper. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Yahweh Roe. Lo Lexar. Lo Lexar. <laughs> so we have reason for hope. Amen. Even though we're walking through the valley of the shadow of volcanoes, we will fear <laughs> no evil. Exactly. <laughs> Amen. Exactly. <laughs> so back on the topic of seat seats, how how um did they teach their children to do it, or did was there individuals assigned to to, to uh, basically you just pay to set up the seat seat on on garments for you? Well, uh, that's my question in regards to the tradition. Well, keep in mind that in the biblical days, yeah, most people uh, made their own garments by creating the cloth and then making their garments out of the cloth that they created. If you are making yourself a square garment, kind of like a poncho or something. But this day, nobody makes their own garments. They have gar other people make it for them. That's my question. How does tradition look upon having others do it for you? Well, as long as you pay for it, you're, you're actually counted as having done it yourself. Okay, and that's what I was asking. And you would definitely need to rededicate it because it's a transference from other hands into you now. And uh, it, it would be very advantageous, though, that when you do buy the seat seats with the, the uh, blue uh, thread, that you actually thread it yourself. There, there is a process that you do a prayer. And most people don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Most <laughs> people don't want to do it themselves. Don't have the time to do it. We'd rather pay somebody else so to do it. So my question is God about is having other people. not worthy of your time? <laughs> <laughs> I would say God would understand my heart and judge okay, me by well, it rather than let other people will do too, but I'm just saying we need to be careful what messages we are sending mm. by our actions or lack thereof yes we need to be careful about put you know not allowing to put ourselves put barriers in front of us when there's opportunities to take that special moment between you and and the father or like me and the father you and the father uh you know to uh you know have a deeper relationship in doing so because we everything that we do um in according to the torah is by our act of faith 
I understand, and I'm speaking from from a context here. The question, since I will be brought mm-hmm. up, do you have another topic? And I'm bringing up the topic back to cheat seats, which is important. Sure. It's one thing to say; it's another thing to address modern times. I'm asking the question in the context, since we're in the topic of traditions. How is it looked upon having others do it for you? It's like I say: if you pay them to do it, it's the same as you doing it. Okay. Yeah. It's just like a father that's uh, maybe got a reason why he can't do his own son's circumcision will hire someone who's a professional at it to do it for him. Right. And it's counted as though the father himself had done the circumcision. Same thing with, doctors and Same thing with paying somebody to go through the wardrobe, raise my wardrobe, add to cheat seat to each garment. Here's instructions. But I really, I, I really just like to just share that it, it really is a matter between you and the father mm-hmm. not Amen. tradition well again i bring up a correct question is there yeah. a tradition about that and against that or for it that was you my can, question you yes, can yes, pay yes, someone no. to write you a mezuzah scroll to yeah. put on your door yeah that happen. they do that all the time in israel most people aren't good enough uh, with their uh, fancy scribe work and stuff right. to be able to sit down and write the the uh, they want it to be more right. special, more significant than what they could do. Mm-hmm. So they hire yeah. someone who's a gifted artisan and they write the scroll out for them by hand, roll it up, and they put it in the little holder, and then they nail it to the door, and it's the same as if they had written it themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. find somebody that knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Like and my hand right now <coughs> isn't as stable as it once was. So for me to sit down and write the mezuzah, that would be impossible. Because you have to write those letters pretty small to get it all to fit on a little scroll that will roll up in a little holder, right? And if I did that, he wouldn't be able to read it. <laughs> I mean, missing the point, right? <laughs> so. Now, what about dedicating, dedication of these garments? Uh, and I know, I don't know where we are time-wise, but to uh, the mikvah uh, process to be dedicated to God and purifying them. Is that do we have enough time to cover that topic while we're at it? I and think that's a bit much to try to cover tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She said, hey, what do you want to talk about next? And I think we're pretty much out of time. We, It's already 8.30, and we usually try to get through it around 8. Oh. So. Well, well uh, <laughs> arrived late. Um, so one last thing I would ask while, while wrapping up and summary on these topics, on the lever, the Levi... Um, law of next the next kinsman the redeeming kinsman uh, how is that now looked upon in orthodox or modern Judaism today well I believe it's still a law for today and so they still they still apply those mm-hmm same laws by force if you're in the, in the in the land of Israel or is it by by option or is it by lenience if somebody is going to buy the buy the the uh, wife of the person who died then it is by law done and she doesn't have a say in it not really herself completely undesirable uh, versus somebody that she wants and at that particular time they were pretty much chattel anyway so it was a matter of you want to starve you want somebody who will take good care of you I'll tell you Boaz really wanted this woman she must be some beautiful lady (laughs) because it was also done with all of your uh, bonded indebtedness slaves and things of that nature if you uh you got to a point where you could no longer earn enough to pay off your creditors. 
uh, you would have to work for them. And from what I was told, uh, the court that you were referring to posted a notice on that passageway going in. And when your name was on that, um, you could no longer buy and sell or anything else that you were now owned by the by the predator. Mm -hmm. and Until you were released or exactly. redeemed. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there was I was told that guy I did this this part I, I don't know that um, the comment um, that Christ would double the sins of Israel and that really seemed very, very confusing, and I heard a lot of really stupid explanations of it. But uh, apparently, when the kinsman redeemer came and redeemed them, that is, bought them to be to be freed, that the notice on the wall, rather than just being removed, because that could have been done any number of ways, was folded over and put back up there to indicate that you were free. Goes so one step further. What's that? Right, but it was posted, so that it did. It wasn't just missing. You are free, mm -hmm. and that process of folding that over was called doubling. Mm -hmm. So by doubling the sins, it actually meant that the kids had, heard that one. Had, yeah. had had totally. Uh, I'd like to suggest for all of you, and that Christ was in that position. There are a couple of really good books called the Jewish Book of Why and the Second Jewish Book of Why <laughs> that answer a lot of questions about Judaism, uh, traditions, and customs. Is that available online or bookshops? Or? Oh, you can get them real cheap over at the Barnes & Noble I mean, online if you go online mm -hmm. and search for the Jewish Book of Why. Right. Okay. You'll find out you can get them really cheap. Why? Like a dollar ninety something <laughs> for a hardbound covered for a hardbound covered uh, in excellent condition used book. You can get them for like a couple bucks. Or okay. high price books maybe. Yeah. The library. So, if you can mm -hmm. get it for a couple bucks, why would you want to go to half price? <laughs> but it answers questions like, why don't Jews put flowers on graves? And why, um, you know, all kinds of stuff like the Jewish Book of Why. Hmm. Um, and I would highly recommend that if you don't have that book, buy one. Keep it in your library. Because it'll be a, a good resource for you to be able to go back and look hmm. at things as you, if you continue uh, your affiliation with Zion, then there'll be things coming up and you can say, I wonder why they did that. I got a book that'll probably tell me. <laughs> <laughs> You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, okay. Get it online. Look up right on now. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, you answer a question with a question. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Well, I hope this was informative tonight. Yeah, sure it was. As always. As always. Good. It really helped after we prayed, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly got rolling. Uh, there's uh, so many things to me. I mean, as simple as having to use epithets to explain everything. And just say, Yeah, I swear by anything, and uh, uh, to me, if you have that much involved in it, anger and uh, just general emotions, it's because you don't trust mm -hmm. God enough. It's an expression to me of, you're all wrapped up in this thing, and you don't have any control over it. Mm -hmm. Give it to him. Yep. <laughs> There's no You're here. here. <laughs> this stuff. Preach it, brother. Rabbi. <laughs> oh, we're done. Okay.
giving up your, your jacket or anything else. You know, I can Thank you for joining us for another teaching. Um, we are starting a new series called Customs and Traditions from the Bible in your Torah. And so uh, we are looking forward for next week. See what Yahweh has to share with us further. So, um, But do remember that we have our weekly Shabbat services, that which occur Saturday morning at 10 a.m., Bible's Issues class, followed by our main service at 11 a.m. with worship, liturgy, and another teaching. And uh, continue to strive forward and to have faith in the truth and be a light unto this world so that all will come and see that Yahweh is good. We'll see you later. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>